I was very interested in the psychic transformations of people in countries like India and China when they become successful, when they move on from rural peasant societies to living in, you know, urban metropolitan uh, settings. Uh, I was very interested in what happens to them, to their private lives, to their souls, to their minds. And none of this, I felt, was really something that I could write about in, 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 in non-fiction. Uh, and also, I think, I was also disenchanted with the way non-fiction or the way the world of facts, world of facts had kind of splintered and fragmented. You know, there were the facts of the so-called traditional media, the legacy media, there were the facts of social media, there were the facts of right-wing troll factories, uh, misinformation factories. And if you as an intellectual and as a, as a journalist are, you know, competing with those, you're always at a disadvantage. So in a strange way, I felt that fiction had more capacity to tell the truth than the so-called facts out there. When we first became independent in 1947, what were the founding ideals of a country like India? And there were many countries in Asia and Africa uh, with different ideals. The founding ideals were justice, equality, dignity, um, and liberty, uh, definitely. And those ideals were formulated in response to an experience of Western imperialism that denied you all those values. Um, and that imperialism, which extended itself over several continents, uh, was also deeply exploitative. It was deeply connected to a world capitalist system, a global capitalist economy. And therefore, post-colonial nations were suspicious of capitalism for that reason, because it was too implicated in their exploitation. So we wanted to build equal societies. We wanted to build socialist societies. Um, so those were our founding ideals. Over time, it became more and more difficult to pursue those ideals. Uh, due to many reasons, it's impossible to go into them right now. Uh, domestically, internationally, the situation was not conducive. Uh, so very quickly, many of these countries became uh, dictatorships, uh, very quickly they became dysfunctional, uh, very quickly because of also sometimes of Western pressure, uh, they were strangled at birth, uh, they were not able to follow their ideas and, and, and principles. Uh, in India's case, we were fortunate to at least maintain those ideas until, you know, the 1970s and 80s. I, I remember growing up with this notion that India was going to represent something new in the world. Uh, was to bring something new to geopolitics, to the world economy, to the world intellectual culture. Uh, what we've seen in the last two, three years that India has become uh, an imperfect, sadly not very good copy of the West. Uh, it's got a whole lot of uh, uh, ideologies, uh, consumption patterns, uh, brand names, uh, capitalist brand names, global brand names uh, that did not exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and now it's full of them. Its national ideology is the same as the national ideology of, of the United States or, or, uh, or Great Britain, uh, which is economic growth, economic expansion. It's turned its back on Gandhi. It's turned its back on, on Nehru. It's turned its back on its founding ideals. Um, and that's been really, in many ways, the tragedy of many of these post-colonial countries that started out with great hopes, great expectations, uh, as a desire to offer an alternative to horribly exploitative and destructive uh, systems of, of economy. Breaking free of the past is a very ambivalent, it's a very ambiguous experience. Um, you get liberation, but at the same time, you're liberated into a vacuum, a moral vacuum, an intellectual vacuum, a spiritual vacuum. And that's something I wanted to capture. You know, the past is full of pain, the past is full of deprivation. The modern world is, offers you success, it offers you fulfillment of various sorts, it offers you freedom of various sorts. But at the same time, uh, once you lose 
contact with everything that defined you, everything that gave you identity, everything that gave you dignity. And you find yourself in a new world, you find yourself disorientated, you find yourself struggling to create a new identity for yourself. The temptation to become modern, that's a temptation, that's the fundamental temptation for all of us who grow up in uh, underdeveloped, poor societies, you know, because modernity is your, is your gateway to a better life, a more fulfilling life. And we spend all our lives, we spend all our energies trying to work towards that outcome, which is modernization, secularization. And I've been stuck because the process has been very successful in my own case, you know. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, interested in, in how even when you do everything right in this process of becoming modern, you find yourself in a strange... Um, impasse, uh, a stalemate of sorts, where uh, having achieved all your dreams, having achieved all your material dreams, you find yourself discontented, you find yourself uh, restless. And that is the condition I wanted to capture, that uh, modernization is offered as a liberation. And yet this liberation, this freedom comes with many, many psychic uh, costs uh, with a different set of sufferings and traumas and we have to become aware of them and many people are unable to to, to deal with those traumas. I wanted to explore uh, how a relationship with your past uh, and you know that relationship with the past is first of all through the language that you grew up speaking but also there are other languages of affection of solidarity that you have with your family members with your friends, with your community. When you become successful, when you become, you know, more, more let's say, uh, more settled in the wider world, you break from all those things. This is a very odd experience because in Spain or in, or in the UK or in many kind of more advanced or developed societies, the past or your parents or your family is not something you break from radically. You know, uh, even if you move to a big city, even if you become a hedge funder, they're always there. Uh, you can return to them. They might be living in the same city or may, same place, uh, but they're there. You can return to them. You can talk to them, not without too much difficulty. In India, there is a rupture. Returning home becomes more and more difficult, if not totally impossible. Home is constantly being transformed. You start speaking in English, you lose touch with your language, your parents still speak in Hindi, your friends, old friends still speak the same languages. You have acquired a different worldview, they have the same, they have the old worldviews. Sometimes the things they say uh, reminds you of backwardness. And once you have embarked on the path of modernity, everything that belongs in the past starts to look like something backward. There's a scale of comparison there, you know, that modernity is somehow better than uh, tradition. Uh, so tradition starts to look to you like something you should stay away from. A language like English represents true otherness for us. You know, people who've grown up in speaking Hindi or Urdu in India and Pakistan. English is a very remote and foreign language. Even though English is spoken all around in India, as you know, you know, it's a, it's a very common language. In, in India. But at a very deep emotional level, English is, remains a foreign language. Uh, in a, in a, I would say Spanish feels closer to me than English because Spanish is full of Arabic words which I can identify or recognize and there's a lot of Arabic in Urdu. So it's a, almost a kind of bridge language to the West, you know. English doesn't have that same heritage. So it feels remote and when you start conducting most of your life in a foreign language, then you're going to feel a degree of disorientation, definitely. Uh, I mean, it's one thing for people who've grown up in England or America of Indian origin, like the current Prime Minister of the UK, who's only spoken English. So it doesn't, he doesn't feel that rift, rupture within himself. But all of us who've grown up in a different language feel that rupture. Class is absolutely hugely important. I mean, I feel like um, a lot of the conversation today uh, about justice, for instance, has been overdetermined by the issue of racial and ethnic differences. And that has obscured the very important uh, issue of class. Um, 
in a in a and that I see very clearly when I see uh, rich Indians, for instance, claiming victimhood when they are in Europe or when they are in um, America and saying, look, we are the historical victims of imperialism and, and so on and so forth. And in many ways, they are actually the beneficiaries of an unjust system. I know, I mean, um, what is often, when we play that kind of identity politics in the West, uh, what we don't realize is the people who are claiming to be victims of racism or victims of imperialism are themselves beneficiaries of deeply hierarchical and unjust systems of social relations in the respective countries that they come from or their parents came from or their grandparents came from. So the one reason why they're claiming victimhood or they're claiming moral virtue through victimhood is because that's the prevailing discourse. And if you claim uh, you know, victimhood, there might be some reparations in the form of greater representation for you in professional fields here or in educational fields here and so on and so forth. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem of systemic injustice. That doesn't actually, you know, a rich Indian getting promoted, becoming the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is not going to solve the problem of uh, the many, many poor uh, Indians and Pakistanis living in, in, in Britain today. In fact, it's going to make the problem worse because what is more important for the Indian Prime Minister is his class position. He's one of the richest people on earth. What we saw in the last two or three decades is that organic, embryonic connection between working class cultures and movements and political parties on the left was broken. The political parties became more and more metropolitan in their structures, in their representations, and in their worldviews, in their ideologies. Uh, and that has been the fatal disconnection that leaves the left today um, incapable of offering an alternative because the metropolitan left signed up to these kinds of progressively liberal, economically right-wing causes. So let's have a market economy, let's have a new liberal economy, let's also have social liberalism, let's have you know, full rights for uh, homosexuals or, or for other minorities. They've, they've come with these ideas because morally they feel that justice is more important than becoming wealthy. They feel that equality has a greater value than inequality. Very well intentioned, but at the same time, their experience doesn't really connect them to the lives of most people who were the natural constituency of the left. And so they feel themselves disconnected um, and they, you know, circulate among themselves. They create international, uh, you know, in a way, kind of solidarities, other people on social media, they tweet at each other, they retweet each other's posts. Uh, they talk about rights for minorities, for transgenders, for, for women, uh, for ev every kind of minority. But because those causes are not connected to any organizations working you know, in, on the streets, in the factories, they become more and more abstract and virtual almost. You know? And that is what we've seen today, is that we've seen a massive exodus of progressive energies into the virtual space. Whereas uh, offices, factories, uh, workers, they've been completely exposed to whoever exploits them. Uh, the far right uh, is also, in a way, uh, you know, very welfare statist. You know, in many countries, they're saying, "Oh, these new liberals destroyed the welfare state. Let's recreate it." And in order to recreate it, we have to get rid of the immigrants. They are the parasites on the welfare state. So it's just interesting how that works. You know, because the metropolitan left also signed up to the project of shrinking the welfare state. We don't need it, privatization, marketization is gonna take care of everything. Uh, so they created that opening too, for the far right to come in and say, to the working classes who were traditionally left, you know, in France, in Italy, in, in England. I mean, the idea that the working classes will vote Tory was unthinkable, unimaginable. Once you embark on that path, then when frustration uh, happens, which is often the case, then you become vulnerable to people 
who are telling you that um, there is a certain elite that is responsible for your frustration, that for your anger. That's when the far right sees its opportunity. You know, we've seen that again and again. We saw that in Germany when it started to modernize in the, in the late 19th century. Whenever there was a setback, the right wing became more powerful. And in the end, a far right uh, party and a movement uh, took over the entire country. It, something similar has happened in India. That it started off on this grandiose project, not a modest project, you know, not like we're going to become a middle income country. I know China followed a very different trajectory. China never said we're going to be an international superpower. They said we're going to, you know, be a, a, a self-sufficient and strong country. Today, of course, it speaks of, you know, its power and, and glory. But for a very long time, they were very modest about their ambitions. Uh, they were like, let's get people educated. Let's pe pe give some primary health uh, facilities to people. Uh, let's create a workforce. In India, everything happened very differently. Uh, it embraced too quickly these notions of power and, 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 and sort of expansion. But if you give people a reason to hate and identify the enemy, the person to hate, they're going to be with you for a very long time. This is what we're seeing with Trump today. You know, I mean, Trump's uh, main uh, appeal to people is not that he's offering them any goods or anything positive. He's saying, I hate these people and you can uh, hate them together with me uh, and I'll, I'm legitimizing your hatred. This is what he did when he was four years in power, you know, go after this person, go after that person. That is what uh, the Hindu nationalists in India have very successfully done. Seduce people with the politics of hatred. But in most places, I think, the young are people who've experienced one shock after another. Again, I think it's really important to have an experience of the world that shapes your vision. And if you think about young people today, people in their 20s, what have they lived with all this time? They lived with, 9-11 was perhaps too, they were too young. They were too young to uh, have experienced it, but financial crisis, uh, you know, Trump, the rise of the far right, economic, one economic shock after another, uh, war in Ukraine. I mean, the world kind of falling apart. Most importantly, the facts of climate change. That's for young generation is like a massive wake up call. So with this experience, they can look at the world and see that it needs radical fixing. You know, we need to really look at this and come up with solutions to this. Even this, this realization today is gone missing among so many older people. There are people, important politicians today in this country who are saying, anyone who talks of climate change must be a communist. Um, there are climate change deniers. Donald Trump was a denier. I mean, you know, uh, th that generation is truly hopeless, I feel. So it's only the younger generation that has experienced this crisis that we are in today in a more intimate way. A generation that is facing a future that might be much, much worse than the present. A generation that feels truly motivated to act and to think to prevent that terrible future from being realized. I think there is hope there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's in, it lies in uh, the fact that they've realized that things are terrible. They could get much, much worse. We have to do something about it.